Okay, so the title of my talk is Engineering of Polymer Nanoparticle Morphology for Paint Applications. So I'm going to start by briefly introducing the sort of work we do in my group. So we're mainly concerned with uh, dispersed phase polymerization from the perspective of polymer and nanoparticle synthesis. So we mainly work with emulsion and mini emulsion polymerizations and also dispersion polymerization. So different types of heterogeneous polymerizations. And the, the main focus of what we do is to try to control the particle morphology. So in terms of say hollow structures, gradient uh, non-spherical structures such as worm-like structures and so forth. And another important focus of our team is to implement controlled living radical polymerization in dispersed systems, such as, for example, raft polymerization, which has been our focus of late. And of course, polymeric nanoparticles find wide applications, and one important field of application is uh, paints and coatings. So over recent years, um, there's been a major drive to, um, to basically reduce the use of organic solvents uh, in industry at large. And in the paint industry, we, we basically have two different types of paints in simple terms. We have organic solvent-based paints, where the polymer is dissolved in an organic solvent, basically. Then we have waterborne paints and coatings, where typically you deal with an aqueous emulsion of polymer particles. And in both cases, when you cast a film, uh, you get evaporation of the solvent and then subsequent film formation. So th there's a range in recent times of legislative and environmental requirements to reduce the emission of uh, so-called VOCs, volatile organic compounds. So, so therefore, there's a very strong desire to try to move from organic solvent-based traditional paint and coatings techniques to waterborne uh, technologies. Um, one issue with this, though, is that typically to date, the organic solvent-based systems tend to perform better than the waterborne systems. And in order to, to basically create uh, waterborne systems that behave as well in terms of film properties and film formation as the organic solvent-based systems, typically there's a need to add different kinds of additives uh, which are frequently uh, volatile organic, organic compounds. So uh, quite often issues in terms of performance with waterborne paints and coatings tend to be as written here, poor gloss, uh, some issues with cracking. They can also be poor moisture and chemical resistance. And, and these are significant issues um, when we're dealing with commercial application of paints. So. There's a strong desire then to basically improve the performance of waterborne paints and coatings. So I'm going to explain just very briefly uh, the idealized view of latex film formation. So a latex here refers to polymer particles dispersed in water. And I should say that this uh, slide is from uh, Joe Keddy from the University of Surrey. So we start with a uh, polymer in water dispersion like this. You cast this on a substrate, and as the water evaporates, we obtain close packing of particles. Uh, subsequently, we obtain some deformation of these particles. There's an interdiffusion and coalescence process, and eventually, if all goes well, you typically obtain a homogeneous film. So in order for this to be able to happen, it is crucial that um, most notably the, the TG, the, the uh, glass transition temperature of the polymer particles is suitable because if the, pol if the particles are in the glassy state, then this interdiffusion and coalescence stage basically cannot occur and we have a problem. And, and that's when you get very poor, uh, poor films, typically with cracking. So what I'm going to talk about today is uh, how some of these issues can be overcome or potentially overcome using different types of particle morphologies. So the first one is so-called gradient nanoparticles. 
So this is something we have been working on quite a bit in my group uh, for a few years. And the second one is more of a futuristic uh, high end uh, approach, so to speak, which deals with so called multi layered nanoparticles as seen in this uh, cartoon here. So the, the focus um, in this presentation is essentially solely on the synthetic aspects of these particles, as, as in how can we um, prepare particles like this. So I'm not going to be talking about film formation or um, material properties. So gradient polymer particles, what, what does this mean? The, the basic idea is that you have a particle that looks something like this, where if you go from the core section of the particle to the surface section or the interface with the aqueous phase, you basically have a continuous gradient such that the polymer chains that are located here contain basically only polymer A, and the polymer chains that are located here basically contain only polymer B. And then in between here, you would have copolymers with basically uh, different types of intermittent uh, compositions. So, so there's a gradient across the particle as you go from the interface to the core. And the idea is that typically you would have a hard core and a soft shell. And this is referred to as gradient morphology. So the, the reason that we're interested in this is that th there's basically a bit of a paradox in terms of the requirements for, for TEG, for the glass transition temperature, um, from the perspective of film formation properties and the properties of the final film. So we need a low TG for film formation to occur, as I showed in the earlier slide. So, so if the TG is too high, you cannot cast a, a decent film from an aqueous latex. On the other hand, you need a high TG in order to get uh, good properties of, of the final polymer film. So if the TG is too low, there, there can be issues with hardness, that the film can be too soft or too weak. And there can also be issues with the so-called blocking, which is when the film basically becomes quite sticky. And the proposed solution to this, or what is currently employed, is to use uh, different types of composite particles. And the, the classic approach is to use a so-called core shell morphology, where you basically have a hard core and a soft shell. So you basically tick both of these boxes. The, the problem with this approach is that you tend to get a heterogeneous film, as you can imagine, where you have these uh, hard domains essentially dispersed in the, uh, in the softer domains. And the problem with this is that this, this can give uh, relatively poor properties, uh, in particular in terms of gloss. So the solution to this has been to basically create uh, or design gradient type morphologies, as I explained on the previous slide. So if you have this type of situation where, as I explained, the, the composition of the polymer chains would change from basically a homopolymer of A to a homopolymer B with everything else in between, you don't get this phase separation type situation, but rather you get a much more homogeneous film. And, and these sort of films have been shown to give uh, as good or even better properties than the core shell particles and you don't tend to have the issue with poor gloss, so the films get a, a lot more shiny, which can be important for a number of applications. So in our work, we, and in industry at large, uh, aqueous emulsion polymerization tends to be the approach of choice. And, and just to quickly illustrate how this works, you basically have a, a system that comprises uh, surfactant, monomer, and water. And if we're dealing with micellar nucleation, which is perhaps the most common scenario, then you have a surfactant micelle in the aqueous phase, and you have large monomer droplets stabilized also by surfactant. Polymerization occurs in these uh, submicron-sized uh, polymeric nanoparticles. And it's important to realize that Monomer basically just diffuses from the monomer droplets to the polymer particles, 
So polymerization occurs in the polymer particles, not in the monomer droplets. So emulsion polymerization is attractive for a number of reasons. It's environmentally friendly, given that the continuous phase is water. These are low viscosity system. They can be readily implemented on an industrial scale. And we also tend to get very high polymerization rate, which can be a great advantage, as we shall see in the second part of today's talk. So typically the way a um, gradient morphology is prepared is using this sort of setup that I'm about to explain here. And the challenge is really how to characterize the gradient morphology. How do you actually show that you do have a gradient morphology? So the way we set this up is we basically have two monomer tanks. There's the so-called so far tank, which contains the blue monomer. The near tank contains the red monomer. And then you're feeding the blue monomer into the red monomer tank. And then subsequently this tank is fed into the reactor. And you also have an initiator feed tank. So there's a little animation here illustrating how this happens. So if I start this, you should be able to see how the content in the tanks gradually decreases. And we see the development in the ideal scenario of the gradient nanoparticle. So I should point out here that in order for this to happen the way it does, uh, the feed rate from tank one into tank two is only half the feed rate of tank two, this tank, into the reactor. So it's been claimed uh, in many publications and patents that this actually does give a gradient morphology. So, so one of the things we have focused on in some of our recent work is to uh, try to establish experimentally whether this is really the case. And we have done that using X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, XPS. So the approach we have taken has been to, to basically create a polymer latex using the exact approach that I showed on the previous slide. Then what we do, we would freeze that using liquid nitrogen and then dry it under vacuum. So it's basically a freeze drying approach. And it's important to do that because we have to be able to uh, preserve the particle morphology before we do the analysis. And then we basically do XPS of this dry powder. So, so XPS is a surface analysis technique. So we only see up to something like the first five nanometers in depth of the polymer particle. And given that typically the polymer particle might have a diameter of something like 50 nanometers, depending on the conditions, this can be a useful approach to, to surface characterize the particles. So the way we do this is we run the emulsion polymerization and as the polymerization runs, obviously the particle size will increase gradually and we build up different layers of the particle. So as we do that, we take multiple samples as a function of time and we check the surface composition and then by basically correlating the polymerization time with the morphology, that we obtain in that surface layer, we can build up a map, if you will, of the how the composition changes as a function of distance from the core of the particle to the surface. So we can basically distinguish between different types of morphologies, such as these uh, ideal graded nanoparticles and uh, simple core shell nanoparticles or homogeneous particles. So just to illustrate that this actually works, we, we first did some experiments where we used a model recipe comprising styrene and methyl methacrylate. So, so these are high TG monomers or that, that give high TG polymers. So these cannot undergo film formation. And we did this to make sure that film formation itself doesn't distort the morphology that we actually observe. So, so the setup is just as I explained previously in, in the uh, a few slides ago. So we have MMA in this tank, we have styrene in this tank. The MMA goes into this tank and the combined contents here will go into the reactor. 
where we start off with the seed latex and we use the surfactant SDS and this initiator um, APS, an aqueous phase initiator. So the very first thing we did was we tried to do this using MMA only. So we make homogeneous particles. And if I just quickly go back, so, so what this means is we have MMA in this tank and we ha have MMA in this tank as well. So doing it this way, we obviously only obtain PMMA particles. There's nothing else in them. And we did that to basically test that the XPS approach makes sense, that it works. So we find that for if we, if we count the atoms, the heavy atoms, for MMA, we have two oxygen atoms. So as an atom percentage, that becomes basically about 28%. And we see here that the experimental data points um, correspond really well with the theoretical number here. And, and this little thing we see in the beginning is due to the oxygen that we have in the surfactant and the initiator. So we're basically counting oxygen atoms. Now we can do pretty much the same thing using carbon, using carbon atoms. And we see in that case, it, it also looks very good. We get very good agreement. So. So we basically have quite some confidence that this actually works well. So, so now when we do this using the, the real system where we use two different monomers, it's of course important that the conversion is high. So we need to have a situation where um, the, the instantaneous conversion is very high because if it isn't, then you don't get star fed conditions and under such circumstances, it's impossible to get this layered structure. So, so the basic pr principle here is that if the instantaneous conversion is very high, then the polymer radicals that enter the particles from the aqueous phase, they're basically unable to diffuse towards the core and polymerization occurs in the surface layer only of the particle. So we see in this plot here that um, we have a very high monomer, courage, monomer conversions throughout the feed time. So we feed these monomers over three hours. So, so that criterion is basically satisfied. Now, you might wonder, well, can we not just use uh, TAM, electron microscopy, to see these morphologies? So, so these are positively stained particles here, and, and we see they're fine looking particles. However, there's obviously no way that we can actually judge what type of morphology we have here. We can do the DSC, uh, differential scanning calorimetry. And we did that basically to confirm that we don't have uh, homopolymer domains. So the fact that we only see one peak, one homogeneous peak like this and not two peaks, that is basically indicative of the fact, or it's consistent with the fact that we have a gradient structure, although it doesn't necessarily prove it. So th this is really the, the main result of these types of experiments. So, so we're plotting the oxygen atom content versus time, polymerization time or feed time. And we're comparing a range of different particles here. So we look at a homogeneous PMMA latex. And in that case, there's obviously no change in the surface structure. If we have a homogeneous polystyrene latex, it's the same thing. We're sitting down here at very, very low oxygen content. And that oxygen content merely corresponds to the oxygen in the initiator and in the surfactant. Now, for the two-stage system, this one here. So in this case, we first feed um, the, the styrene monomer and basically polymerize that. And second, we feed MMA monomer, the red one. And when we do this, we see these black data points here that we basically get a very sharp transition in the oxygen content at, as we go from, from styrene to MMA. So this is consistent with this type of structure. Now, if we do the gradient feed, we obtain this green trace here. So this really illustrates that as the polymerization time increases, and this then corresponds to as you go from the core section 
to the interfacial section. We basically see how gradually the composition changes from more or less uh, pure polystyrene to pure PMMA. So, so that's consistent with a gradient type structure. Um, I, I should also say here that there is the issue of thermodynamic control versus kinetic control. And it does turn out that at least under these conditions, if you do this polymerization the other way around, so if you basically switch these feed tanks and feed the uh, methyl methacrylate monomer first, then ideally you would get the same sort of thing, except the layers, or sorry, the, the order of the monomer would be reversed. And part of the equation here is that the interfacial tension between polystyrene and water is higher than that between PMMA and water. So the system where PMMA is closer to the aqueous phase is actually thermodynamically uh, favored. And it can be shown that if you actually switch the tank, then you cannot obtain this type of gradient morphology. So thermodynamic control does also play a role clearly in these systems. So I'm not going to go into detail with this slide, but just briefly to show we can calculate what an ideal gradient morphology would look like, and we can compare that with what a fully mixed system would look like. So fully mixed, meaning that you don't get the gradient structure at all, but the chains are basically randomly mixed, uh, and, and you don't have the ideal structure at all that you want. So if we calculate the ideal gradient, that would look something like this. So this basically corresponds to to the situation where you don't have any gradient structure. So sorry, I, I said that the wrong way around. The ideal gradient corresponds to the situation where you have the perfect gradient, exactly what you want. The, the fully mixed situation is where the chains are completely mixed throughout the particle and there's no concentration gradient at all. And we see that in our case, in, in this experimental case, we basically wind up in between these two cases. So we basically think that this shows that we can get a gradient type structure, although it's not fully ideal. And part of the issue as well is one to do with XPS. So we, we basically see not only the top layer, we see the top say five nanometers or perhaps a little bit more. And that means you basically average the composition out a bit, which means you artificially, so to speak, move from the ideal gradient to the fully mixed system. But, but basically, we think this shows that you are actually able to obtain uh, particles that do have certainly a tendency towards the gradient morphology. So the, the last part of my talk is about multi-layered polymer structures in uh, polymer nanoparticles. So the idea here is we can use uh, raft polymerization to really engineer particles having quite fancy morphologies. And we do this using multi-block copolymers. So a multi-block copolymer is something that looks like this, where you basically have um, essentially homopolymers, or they can be copolymers, but they're basically discrete segments that are covalently linked. And th the challenge with making these type of structures has been to obtain systems where you can have high livingness. So basically obtain the chain and functionality in a reversible deactivation radical polymerization to high conversion. And this has been a challenge in the past, but uh, over the past 10 years or so, it's been shown that using a uh, copper mediated radical polymerization or raft polymerization under optimized conditions, this can actually be done and, and you can go to very high conversion in these polymerizations with high livingness. So it means you can basically just prepare, say the red polymer first, and when that is done, you add the blue monomer and so forth. And you can make these uh, quite fancy multi-block copolymer structures. So one feature of emulsion polymerization that is actually crucial to get this to work in terms of raft polymerization is the concept of compartmentalization. So the polymerization occurs in nano-sized polymer particles, and this can have quite an impact on the kinetics. And without going into detail here, we have the segregation effect, which basically prevents propagating radicals in different particles from terminating. 
And this means that the polymerization can proceed much faster. And given that you have a faster polymerization, uh, from a kinetic perspective, this means that you can obtain a higher level of end functionality, which is crucial when you run these uh, multi-block copolymer syntheses. So typically the way we do this is we would first prepare a amphiphilic macro raft agent. So in this particular example, we have a segment of acrylic acid, a uh, hydrophobic segment of styrene, and this would be a typical trithiocarbonate raft agent. So we dissolve this in water. This self-assembles into micelles. These micelles will then swell with the monomer that we add. And as we do the polymerization, we generate uh, the first set of seed latex uh, nanoparticles. Now, after this, we can do several sequential polymerization steps. And by doing that, we generate a multi-block copolymer as shown here. And if all goes well under the under appropriate conditions, we can generate multi-block copolymer particles with this type of layered structure where the chains basically reach from the uh, interface towards the core. So the hydrophilic bit of the raft agent would be located here, and the actual raft end group is located towards the core of the particle. So, so this really gives us the opportunity to, to truly, truly um, nano-engineer particles. And, and if you remember from the very beginning of this talk, when I spoke about there are different criteria in terms of TG for film formation and ultimate film properties, this can really provide you with uh, very interesting tools to nano-engineer particles for very specific purposes. So we have actually analyzed the chain lengths in relation to the size of these particles, and we have been able to show that it does make sense that the chains actually stretch from the core towards the middle of the particle like this. So, so just to illustrate the, the concept, uh, we first done systems where we use a so-called model homopolymer system. So it's basically a multi-block copolymer, but we use the same monomer. So this one contains uh, nine blocks of polystyrene. And the GPC distributions show that this is basically proceeding as we would expect. And we also get high conversion. So it's of course important in a case like this that we don't have secondary nucleation. So we want to be able to show that the particles grow nicely with increasing conversion as we go along and create each block. And we see here from the number distribution of the particles and these TEM images that as we go from block one to block two, and then I'm showing block five and also block nine, th this proceeds uh, pretty much in an ideal manner as we would like. So in terms of the morphology then, um, this here shows you a system comprising uh, polystyrene blocks and uh, polybutyl methacrylate rich blocks. And we have taken uh, samples and looked at the TEM images as we go from block to block, basically. So what we can see here are th these are the ideal structures. So looking at these TEM images, we can clearly see here that we have a core shell structure. As we keep growing blocks, it, it gets a little bit tricky to see what's going on. So looking at this last one, it is possible to see rings here, but it's not really quite clear. And, and one reason for that is, of course, the fact that there's a 3D effect. So these are spherical particles. So it's very difficult to see these sort of this sort of layer structure. To, so to really show this, we uh, did ultra thin cross section. So we basically slice these polymer particles into thin slices. And if we do that, we can actually see quite nicely how we have a structure that basically quite closely corresponds to what we're aiming for. Um, if you look carefully, you can actually see that there's one layer missing here, and we think that's to do with the fact that in this particular case, the final block was relatively short. So that may have been why we can only see, um, in this case, four layers. But it is uh, quite clear that it is possible to generate these sort of elaborate structures, and this really opens up a powerful toolbox in terms of how you can truly engineer polymeric nanoparticles for specific applications. So, so th this is relatively new work, and it remains to be seen to what extent one is able to fine-tune uh, 
film formation and film properties based on being able to judiciously selecting essentially each of these uh, polymer layers based on um, chemical properties uh, as well as glass transition temperature. Okay, I'm out of time. So just to conclude, uh, I've tried to explain how engineering of polymer nanoparticle morphology can really be a very important tool for the future in terms of how we can improve the both the film formation properties and the physical properties of the films for uh, waterborne um, coatings. And, and this is really the way to go, I believe, in terms of how we can improve the performance of waterborne systems and hopefully one day be able to fully replace uh, solvent borne systems, which is really the way to go to strive in terms of obtaining a better environment. OK, so I'm out of time. So with that, I'm going to leave this slide with the acknowledgments and uh, I thank everyone for tuning in. Thank you very much.